Take uh, verse 3. If you take notes, I've entitled the message, Fatal Attraction. Fatal Attraction. Thus saith the Lord. I'm just going to use the first part of that verse. You love evil more than good. Before we look into it, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us find an application for ourselves in, this, uh, in these six words. Spirit of God, we come to you in thanksgiving that we have the word of God for everything in our life. We have the complete explanation of everything that's happening. Everything. And no matter how complex it is, no matter how evil or how good it is, we know that you have the answer for us. And so as we look into this verse, I pray that you speak to everybody here. And if there's one listening this morning that knows not Christ as Savior, we pray that today would be the day of their salvation. They'd meet the captain of their salvation, our Lord Jesus Christ. And for others, Lord, we pray you'd, you'd speak to their hearts. You'd bring comfort where it's needed, conviction where it's needed, edification. Whatever is needed this morning in all of our hearts, we pray that you would bring it to us through this message. Speak directly to all of us, Lord. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You love evil more than good. You know, uh, I tell you uh, that I've, in the years I've been here, I've really never come up with a message on my own because I can't. <laughs> If I'm not led to something, either through uh, uh, an event with other people or, uh, or, or God speaking to me through the verse, I've never, he's never failed me once in a message, and especially with this one. And when I was looking at this, you love evil more than good, and I was meditating on it, I was thinking to myself, you know, a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. The news media likes to tell us that the world is getting better. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, we know that there's more evil than good in this world. That's why we have police officers. In every state, in every county, there are people who carry guns trying to keep the evil at bay or incarcerated. We have a military. We have a militia. We have, we have bombs and, and ships and planes, all for one purpose, to prevent evil. At least that's, that's, the, uh, that's the crux of it. Um, although sometimes politically it doesn't work out that way, but we make no mistake about it, the world is not getting better at all. I dare say, that being said, there's nothing in this world, not one thing in this world that attracts a person more than sin, nothing. Because sin is always about feeding our flesh because we love our flesh. It's not regenerated. It's something that demands every day our attention. And there's nothing more deadly in this world, more dangerous or fatal in this world than sin. Nothing. Nothing touches sin. Unfortunately for us, we have a fatal attraction to sin. And it begins when we're children and we become aware of ourselves <laughs> You watch children do that and they'll look at their hands and they'll feel their face or they'll touch your face and they start to become aware of, of their being, a, 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 of them being a being, if you will. And it's when they really get an understanding of their flesh that the edemic nature kicks in and sin uh, begins to develop a fatal attraction. They have a fatal attraction for it. And let me tell you why I call it a fatal attraction. Because the side effect of sin in this world is separation from God. If you're a sinner in this world and, and, and uh, you don't know Christ, you are separated from God. The lost actually are dead to God. The Bible calls them dead to God. Ephesians 2.12, at that time you were without Christ, Aliens from the commonwealth of uh, Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Dead. There are right now millions, billions of people praying to a God, but certainly not the God of Scripture. You enter the spiritual realm, 
If you enter the spiritual realm in your sin, you know what's going to happen. The Bible makes it clear. You're going to be judged, and then you'll be thrown into the internal lake of fire forever. Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, God says, because he has the authority to do that, because he's the creator, and you are owned by him. All souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who practices sin shall die. And in the Bible, that's called the second death. I tell you all of this because I want you to understand that, that there is a fatal attraction to sin even in, this, even in this world to believers. We're still attracted to it occasionally. And I'll get into that in, in a few minutes. And that being said, our text is just one of many indictments to, that God makes against man and sin, his attraction to evil. The biblical record clearly states, except for a very short period of time in Genesis 1 and 2, mankind has practiced and loved evil. And by evil, I'm referring to anything that offends God. In Genesis 3, Man began, man began his fatal attraction with a single act of disobedience. God said, you can have the whole world, but not that tree. And Adam said, I want that tree. Disobedience. In Genesis 4, we see that, diso, uh, that evil, that the attraction to evil is generational. The fir very first uh, thing that uh, the children of Adam and Eve had, two boys, Adam and Cain, the first thing the Bible tells us is that one killed the other, evil. In Genesis 6, man's fatal attraction with evil was so universal, it spread to, throughout the world. It was so great that God testifies in Genesis 6, 5, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of, his, uh, of, intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It spread. And in Genesis 6, 6 and 7, we see what happens, we see, we see what happened when man's fatal attraction to sin corrupted the entire planet. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And guess what? He did. But before he did, what did he do? He found one righteous person out of the millions who populated the world at that time. So, and it was Noah. So God took Noah, and he took his family, and he repopulated the world. But man's fatal attraction to sin wasn't destroyed in the flood. You think it would have been done, he had like eight people, you think it's done. It wasn't done. How do you know that's true? Because the first thing after hitting dry land that Noah did, what did he do? He went out and he planted a vineyard. Then what did he do? In Genesis 9, 21, the Bible says, Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk. Again, we see that sin was not uh, uh, washed away. So you see, even when a man that God called righteous, even in him, there was still a part of him that loved evil. There was still a part of him. That's why our text declares to all mankind, you love evil more than good. To some of you, those words might seem a little difficult. They might be a little hard to understand. They might come as a shock. You can't imagine that you love evil more than good. You can't imagine it. But you need to remember that there may, be, uh, there may be people who are moral, moral people, but they still offend God. There are kind people. People are very generous, but they still offend God. There are, there are uh, uh, good people, generous people, and the list goes on and on about how righteous man can be, but they still offend God. Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6 says, My, uh, you love evil, or excuse me, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's it. We try, but none of us have that. 
The only righteousness we have as believers is the righteousness that comes to us through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of God. And how do we know that's true? Because man is a living testimony to the fact that man loves evil. We're born with the fatal attraction that's already in our hearts as children. David said, uh, David gives us our proof first in Psalm 51.5. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's a reference to original sin, which is the basic instinct to love evil we're all born with. We're all born with that. We all have it. And we see that instinct in, in children, don't we? That basic natural instinct to work on the edemic nature, to have a love of evil. I remember seeing on television not too long ago, I think it was uh, in one of the video shows, a little child, uh, the parents came home and all the chocolate cake and all the cupcakes were gone and the kid was in his diaper and he had chocolate all over his face and hands and his father said, Ralph, did you do that? Did you eat that cake? No, daddy. No, daddy. Are you sure you didn't eat any of that cake at all? No, Dad. He asked them four times, and the kid's standing there with chocolate all over him. The edemic nature to lie. They love it because it, it has to do with the flesh. We also know we have a fatal attraction to sin because we're born and held captive by a mind that hates God. When we come into this world until we have Christ, the Bible says in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is at enmity or is hostile to God for it's not subject to the law of God and neither can it be. And we know that's true because most of the world is hostile to God. Most of the world is. How do we know that's true? False religions, they testify to hating God. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, worship God the way he prescribes. Their reverence towards God, the world's filled with irreverence towards God. And the worshiping of a non-biblical Christ in most evangelical churches today is another proof that men love evil more than good. And how about the desires of our flesh? Are we not held captive by that? You see the, the shackles of sin Paul writes about in Romans 7, 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. It's a struggle. You know, I talk to some people, uh, I talk to people every week. And it seems whenever we're talking about uh, sin, it's always an enemy. And there's always a reason. There's always the principalities and powers, or I got, I'm in spiritual warfare. It might be true. Uh, the world is tempting me. That might be true. But I always tell them the same thing. The worst enemy you're ever going to face is yourself. Why? Because your flesh wants to be fed all the time. Period. That's the battle we fight all the time. Your flesh loves evil. If you're saved, I don't care if you've been saved 40 years or 40 minutes. It doesn't matter. Your flesh has not been regenerated, so what happens is that flesh wants to get back in control, and it wants to be fed. And it's going to do everything it can to see that you try to do that. And your job as a believing Christian is not to let that happen. Lastly, the unregenerate soul is held captive by Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26. Timothy was telling, uh, uh, Paul was telling Timothy how he should speak to people that weren't saved. And he said, correct the, his opponents with gentleness that God uh, may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and that they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We come into this world, beloved, with a fatal attraction to sin. And it's fair to say that not, we were not only born with a fatal attraction, we are born with a heart for sin. Jeremiah 17, 9. I'm, I want to tell you all this. I got something on the other side of this, but I want you to see the full scope of it. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Jesus, in Mark 7, 21 and 22, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, all sorts of wickedness, sensuality, slander, pride, etc. 
These two testimonies are backed up by other scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 4 refers to those who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Psalm 4, 2 talks about loving vanity. Isaiah 66, 3 uh, talks about the delights uh, in their abomination, that they delight in it. So you see, it's not only do we love evil, we also have a heart that loves evil. That shows you how wicked we were before Christ. It's for these reasons. The unregenerate are said to have a depraved nature, a beastly nature. Romans 1.28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. You see, it's only when we're elected out of all of that, only then, out of the world, is that fatal attraction to sin and it's bonded to, ev uh, to, to loving evil, it's only then that bondage is broken. Do you understand why the world is in the shape it's in? All of that stuff I just said to you is what every unregenerate soul has going on. They don't know good. Every one of you that know Christ as your savior, you know good and you know evil and you can make a, you can make a rational choice. You're even influenced by God through the spirit that indwells you to make the choice for good and not for evil. But that evil is still present in you in the form of your flesh. And every day you have to fight it. But imagine, if you can, go back to before you were saved. There was no good in you then. You might have been a moral person. You might have been an upstanding or a generous person. But there was no godly good in any of us before Christ. This whole world was corrupt. I would remind you that God didn't just sentence Adam to death physically and spiritually. He didn't just do that. He didn't send it just the devil. He didn't do that either. He, he, he uh, pronounced judgment on the earth itself. There was no, in Genesis 1 and 2, there was no problems with the, with the, with the environment. <laughs> there was no problems with plate tectonics or with hailstorms or none of that stuff. Everything was perfect. But that's what evil does, is it hates God. Where did it come from? Nobody knows. Man, the devil wherever, but it's an evil influence that's in our world and we live with it every day and it's as real as rain. And even though we can sit in a church, we can pick up this book, we can have the mind of Christ, we can understand what it says, we should never forget, never forget that there's still our flesh and that flesh desires evil. And it is our duty as born again Christians because of the blood that was shed for us, because of all, the, all the, uh, the grace that God has poured into our life, it's up to us to fight that evil every single day, to fight the evil in the world, to fight the temptations that are in the world, to fight the temptations that are in your life. It's our duty to do it. And you have all the equipment to do it. If the devil bothers you, James says, resist the devil and what? He'll flee. If, if you have things going on in your life and they seem difficult, remember Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. No matter what happens in your life, evil or good, the answer's in the Bible. And if it's evil, resist it, and if it's good, cling to it. And that's the problem. We don't do enough of that. Why? We live in a society that's geared for electronics. We live in a society that's geared to a clock. Everything is done according to those two things wrong this book has no clock at the end of it go to the book of revelation there's no clock in eternity just now and i yeah we have to get up and go to work we have to do those specific things we have to do that's true but we have to understand something that everything we do has already has already been put in place by the sovereign god and i don't care what it is we have a prayer list of people even our brother Mel and Joe, our brother and sister Mel and Joe, and all the people on this prayer list, all of them, every single thing that's going on in their life was preordained. Your health problems, your money problems, your car problems, your frozen pipes, whatever it is. And as believers, we should, we should hold on, and that's what evil goes after. Evil goes after adversity. When you have adversity in your life, if you succumb to that in any way, you become, a, you become a walking neon victim in the spiritual realm. Why? 
because you're thinking about what's going on that's bad instead of what's thinking about God. Put it in your life for a reason for good. It's so important to understand that evil is the most, is the most insidious thing that man could ever imagine and the most contagious. That's why it's a fatal attraction because it's so contagious. It takes an act of God, beloved. It takes an actual act of God to remove the evil that we're all born with. Colossians 1.13 says, We've, He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. The first step in our salvation, the very first step, is to remove our basic instinct to love evil. It has to be done by God Himself. That's why I tell you, if you're talking to somebody who's not saved, don't take your Bible and beat them up with it and tell them they're going to go to hell and do it. They can't understand that. You love them instead. You leave them with a question. If you talked about the Bible and they say, well, what if you're wrong and I'm right? Just say, well, okay. I guess I don't lose anything then. But what if I'm right and you're wrong? Hey, listen, I got to go now. Bye. You understand that? You can't, you can't, you cannot defeat evil or, or talk to a person who's lost about spiritual things when the Bible makes it clear they don't understand it. So the best thing you can do and help them defeat that evil in their life is to leave them with a question about what if, what if that's true? It takes an act of God to get somebody out of the kingdom of darkness. It takes it, and Ezekiel says the second step, Ezekiel eleven nineteen. 19, David tells us how, it's, how he does it. This is how God does it. He says, I give them one heart and a new spirit. You see, he has to take the spirit of evil out of you, the endemic spirit of evil out, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Our hearts, we downstairs in Fellowship Hall, we have a stone. I found it. It looks just like a heart. It's the same size. It, it's, it's heavy. It's cold. And it's just like a dead heart without Christ. He has to take that out of us. We can't take it out. You can't take it. You love somebody that's not saved. You can't, you can't make that person love God. God has to do it. I'll put it, uh, I'll put, give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues, keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. You won't follow God if he, wasn't, if he didn't put that, that new heart in you. If he didn't remove your, your attraction to evil, he wouldn't, you would never do the things that you do right now. You couldn't do it. It takes an act of God. This is the spiritual process that takes a lost sinner like you and I, who loves evil, and regenerates them into a new creature. Do you understand that? In other words, when he says that we're a new creature, and he does that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're all new. Why? Because you don't have an evil nature anymore. You're not attracted to it. That's a distinction. To be able to say that I know good and I know bad. And I have a choice every day that I want to make. I go to a church and the church preaches the gospel. I go downstairs and I'm going to Bible studies and I'm learning all this stuff. Once I get them, I have to make the choice. I have to make the choice if I'm going to use them or not. If there's something in this message that's striking your heart, you have a choice. You either make it or you don't make it for good or bad. But the influence of God is in, in you as a believer to do it. Why? Because he doesn't want you to be evil. It's only after we become new creatures in Christ that you can love God. You can't love God until, you, until he puts that in your heart to do it. And only then will a, regenerate, a regenerated soul despise evil and find pleasure in righteousness. I never found pleasure in righteousness, or what I thought was righteous was okay, but it was never the standard of this book. But now I go for it. I find pleasure in doing the right things, making the right choices, being with the right people, having the right attitude, living the right life. I find great pleasure in that. 
I find great comfort in that, great joy in that, even when things are difficult. And it's because, and it's because I've been regenerated. I am a new creature, and so is everybody else that's been regenerated. All we have to do is act like new creatures, and we don't always do that. Why? Because we still have a little taste of, the, of, a, of an attraction for evil because of our flesh. That's what we fight. Another way God breaks the bond of that fatal attraction for us to sin is by putting reverential fear in our hearts. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now I want to tell you something. Reverential fear of the Lord in this, in this day and age is almost unknown. What does that mean? If you went up to a, many Christians and said, hey, you have a reverential fear of God? Yeah, what does that mean? No. A reverential fear and awe of who he is. It doesn't mean a, it doesn't mean a slavish fear like, oh, oh. It's a, it's a reverential fear of his holiness and his goodness. There's A.W. Pink that says, when I think of God and his awesomeness and holiness, I'm, I'm fearful. I have a reverential fear of him. But then when I know that he loves me, I'm at my highest peak of joy that somebody that has those powers loves me and is taking care of me. A reverential fear. Hating evil is not taught anymore. You don't hear sermons like this in every church about sin. Hating evil is not taught or preached in a modern church. So what happens? Christians don't have an interest in it. They're instead... They just feel bad when they sin. Oh, you know what? I did a stupid thing the other day, and psh, boy, I'm glad I got over that. That's what they do. Or they get angry with themselves. Oh, man, I'm so upset because I offended God. They're not shameful. There's a difference. The Bible says repentance with a con repent with a contrite heart. And if you look the word contrite up in the, in the dictionary, in the Greek, it means shameful. Shameful. And, and for me, the, the, the understanding is very simple. God has changed my life in so many ways. He has given me so many things. I understand all the things that are going on in my life and in many things in your life because his book tells me why they're happening. And so when I do something that offends him, I'm, I feel ashamed that I've done How could I do that? How could I do that to one who's given so much for me and somebody that, that's loved me so much? And some will even beat themselves up for a week or two. Well, you know, I didn't, I, I just, I couldn't get over it. I did, couldn't sleep. I didn't eat very well. I had indigestion because I sinned against God. He doesn't care about that. You have to repent. You have to have a heart for God and, and a heart for not wanting to sin against him. He hates evil. We don't hate evil, you know. We don't really hate it. We do not hate evil. We say we do, but we don't. And the proof of it is in our lives. I, I, don't, I never want to see a hand. I'll never ask anybody to raise a hand for this. But if I did, and I said, how many of you, if this is your life, has God right square in the center of it? I guarantee you there wouldn't be a whole lot of hands sticking up. There may be a few, but not a lot. You know why? Because we've organized our life with God in the center when we get saved. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we read and learn to do that. And then gradually, the world, the clock, the flesh, everything just starts rearranging your life. So now God is, in the, is on the outskirts of your life. He's not the main event. And when he's not the main event, the problem with that is that evil will always rear its ugly head up. He has to be the main event in your life. I would remind you, the very first commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, which means make me the center of your life. And you can't do that if you're attracted to sin. You can't do that if you're attracted to the, to the, to the world or if you're so concerned about everything else except God. Think about how many times you go into your prayer closet and pray and all of a sudden your mind's over there and you're over there and you're over there and God is like a second thought. Think about how many times that you do that when you're reading the Bible. You're reading the Bible, something's coming up, and the next thing you know you're thinking about your car or you're thinking about this or you're thinking about that. There's no focus anymore. Why? People don't spend time with God. They spend time with everything else but God. And that's why there's a fatal attraction to evil, even in the evangelical church today. 
Our hatred for sin, if you didn't know this, is not optional. You can't say, well, you know, I hate some sins and some are okay. It's not optional. We're commanded to hate sin. Isaiah 116, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings before, from before my eyes, cease to do evil. And 1 Thessalonians 522 reminds us to abstain from all appearances of evil. I dare say that 1 Thessalonians 522 it says, uh, from all appearances of evil, is such a blanket thing. We can't, we can't even give the appearance of evil. He hates it. And to hate evil, when you hate evil, what you're saying is, I love you, God. So we must hate all things that are evil. You know, that's really how you show God you love him. You make the choice. Evil or God. Good or bad. You make the choice. And it's your love for him that helps make that decision. So you have to ask yourself, how much do I love God? What choices am I making in my life? Am I making choices for God? or am I? Because you're only making them for God or yourself. If, the, if you get down to the bottom line, you either choose God or you choose you. And it's really that simple. Another divine act that breaks the bonds of loving evil is God's love. Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What kind of love is that? It's unconditional. God doesn't love you because you're, there's anything good about us. There's nothing good about any human being in God's eyes. He loves you because he loves you. It's that simple. And he, gets his, he puts his heart inside of you so that you can love him back and you can love me at the same time and love me unconditionally. You can love every brother. You can love your enemies unconditionally. You don't love your enemies because they were good or they were, they were a little better on one day than another. You love them unconditionally, and that means you give them respect. You have that ability. You, you're to love everybody unconditionally. Everything you do should have a fingerprint of love on it everything you do. Why? Because it destroys evil. If you're out there loving people the way God tells us to, you're not out there, you're not out there being attracted to evil. He puts our, his love in our heart. And, and, and the love of God is holy. It's a holy thing. We don't look much at holiness, and, and I feel almost uh, negligent because I haven't preached much on that, but that's going to change. God is a holy God. He's holy above all things. He is, the, he is the, the essence of holiness. And he says, because I am holy, you be holy. And how do we become holy? How do we do that? It's very simple. We obey. We put him in the center of our life. We shun evil and we cling to, and we cling to holiness, to God. We cling to his word. And we live it every day. We put it in our life every single day. You know, we sometimes get up and we become, I guess, as Christians, because in the old days, put another way, in the Old Testament, if you, did, if you had a willful sin, you died. God would kill you or you'd, be, or you'd be punished by death. Why? Because there was no sacrifice for it. We sometimes have a lazy religion because that cross covers so much of our inequities. Iniquities, excuse me. Wait. So much of it. And as a result of that, we're, we're, complacent about, we're complacent about evil and holiness and righteousness, and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. We should be holy because he is holy. And what it means to be holy is to live a righteous life. What it means is I know something I want to do. The Bible says don't do it or don't give an appearance of it, and I do it anyway. That's not being holy. That's not even being obedient. Holiness is bringing God into everything you do, watching your mouth, watching, your, watching what goes through your head, watching what you put in your life or take out of your life. Line it all up with this book and you'll be holy. You'll be righteous. If you don't do that, what are you lining up your life with? You're either lining it up with this or you're lining it up with something else. It's really that simple. When God's love rules the heart, the fatal attraction for sin is dethroned. You cannot have the love of God in you and be attracted to sin at the same time. You can't do it. 
proof verse. If anybody loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we'll come to him and make our home with him, John 15, 23. And in John 15, 24, he says, and if you don't love me, we're not going to do it. We're not going to abide with you, and the truth really isn't in your heart. It's the opposite of it. And you know what? Unfortunately, in the 21st century church, in the church today, it's filled, absolutely filled, with professing Christians who claim to love God, but their words, they're just words. They speak louder than their actions. These are the people Jesus spoke of in Matthew 15, 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is far from me. They reject the command of, of James 1, Be doers of the words and not hearers only deceiving yourself. How many people do we know that like that? Where they go to a, they go to a church and a church preaches the word or, or teaches them stuff and they go out and they don't care. You have to be a doer of, I want to tell you something about God. I don't know if you know this. I think you do, but I want to make sure you know it. God is very serious. He's very, very serious. When he says something, it's an absolute truth. That's what he expects. And if you don't do it, sooner or later, you will. Sooner or later, you will. We have to understand that he's very serious about everything he says in the Bible. In obedience and loving him unconditionally, loving each other unconditionally, putting him the center of his life, obeying the first commandment. All of those things are duties that we have because of what he did for us. In closing, let me tell you how you can, you can know if you love evil, if the love of evil has been removed from your heart. Let me just give you a, a few things. Those who hate sin will feel a crushing, uh, their, their self being crushed by the burden of sin. An example David gives us is in Psalm 40, 12. He says, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up they are more than the hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails me. And another place, he talks about being crushed by the weight of it because he couldn't get rid of it. Do you feel that way when you, when you sin against God? Known sin. We all sin, but known sin. Do you feel that burden that, you need to, that, you, that, that, that you're not right with God, that idea that he knows that you've done something and you just have to, and you haven't told him yet? Another way you know the love of evil is removed is when you starve your flesh, when you don't give in to the flesh. Romans 13, 14, Paul commands us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The flesh is going to be, is going to be with you till the day you go home to glory. If you're saved, and if you're not saved, then I'll talk to you in a minute. If that's the case, then enjoy this world because you're not feeling the burden of you're not feeling the burden of sin if you feel the burden of sin then that means that that you have uh, the uh, the uh, attraction to sin has been removed from your heart doesn't mean that you're not going to sin it simply means that you're not going to be moved by it the way you were before in every realm growth is dependent upon food suitable food and daily food and no different in the spiritual realm the best source of nourishment in this world, in the spiritual world, is God's word. God himself said that in Matthew 4.4. 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There's no better way to get through this life than with this book. And there's no better way to use this book than to incorporate it in your life for every event. I don't care what event it is. I don't care if it's a job event. I don't care if it's a sickness. I don't care if it's salvation. I don't care what it is. Nothing will give you more, a more complete understanding, will give you more confidence and more, and more joy than solving your life by, going, by using this book and bringing it into your life every day. This is, this is what kills the attraction to evil right here. Because this book is eternal. It isn't just for now. It is for now. It's for the eternity as well. Psalm 1611, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's in this book too. So you have a decision to make. 
Those of you that have been regenerated and you know Jesus Christ is your savior, you are not sin free. You will never be sinless. The difference is you don't practice sin. You occasionally fall into sin. And we know that's true because there's no one perfect except Christ. But your job is to, get, is to be sanctified, uh, conformed to the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29 says. And the only way that God can squeeze you out of you and put more of him in you is if, is if you put him in the center of your life. If you don't do that, then it's a part-time it's a part-time confirmation because you're on you're off you're on you're off and listen truly saved people can't be that way for long god will do something about it he'll bring you back to exactly where you need to be that's not a good place that's not a good way to do it far easier for you to listen read your bible and then make him the center of your life there's no fatal attraction to a to a uh, born-again believer because your fatality was up on that cross but what it is is now it's just an attraction and the more you get over yourself and you get into God the less attractive anything will be except him if you're listening to this and you don't know Christ as your Savior then you know what you are fatal you are in fatal attraction to sin and evil all of it there's nothing you can do about it the Bible makes it abundantly clear that um, we're all sinners. Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous. There's none who seek after God. None. We're all sinners. You can't do anything about it on your own. And the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. That means not just death now, because if you're separated from God now, then you can rest assured if you don't correct that, when you leave this realm and go into the eternal realm, you're going to be separated from God there too. And the separation from God means there's two abodes. One abode is heaven, the other is the lake of fire. You have to decide where, where you want to abide. If you feel God stirring your heart and you, and you want to repent of your sins and you, want, and you want to hear the words, whosoever believes in the Lord shall be saved. If you want those words in your life and you want to be saved, you call or see me. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ, you should go home rejoicing, really rejoicing because you know you know, not think, you know your fatal attraction for evil has been replaced with a living attraction for Christ. It's just a matter of how much you want to live for. And it's my prayer that you will live every day closer and closer and put him in more and more of your life. If you do that, then the attraction for sin will be minimal at best. The more of God that's in you, the less possibility there is for sin to be in you or to be even attracted by you. Those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Let's pray. Father, I have no idea why you put this on my heart, but I know that uh, there had to be somebody or people that needed to hear it, either here or online or both. But Father, I know this. I know that that if we make you the center of our life in everything, if we come to you, if everything that comes by us, uh, we sift through the Bible as we know it. Lord, I know that our attraction for anything but holiness uh, will go. We'll be attracted to you and your holiness, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful way that you've uh, uh, regenerated us and left us something to struggle with. And we pray, Holy Spirit, you would help us in that struggle. Help us to make God the first thing in our lives every single day. Help us, Lord, to carry our lights and to shine them in this world bright and, and, and bright as we can into a lost world. And the only way we can do that, Lord, is if you help us by filling our lives with your grace and your mercy and, letting, and helping us to fill ourselves with you so there's no attraction to sin. Thank you, Father. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn is in a red hymnal, uh, red hymnal 705. We'll sing a few verses of I Know Whom I Have Believed, 705.